Hey everybody, so I want to talk a little bit about the titration experiment in GenChem 2. So first off, it's important to understand um, how to do the basic part of titration. That was a joke because you use a base, get it? No, it's not funny. I know. Uh, but the basics of titration are covered in a video that, um, that I made for CH141. So it's worth reviewing that, especially if you didn't actually perform the titration experiment because you were in, um, in lab spring 2020. So um, all of those skills still apply here. And the difference is that instead of really looking for the very, very faint pink color, what we're actually going to do is continue to measure the pH until it is bright pink. Um, so what you're going to end up with is a titration curve. And we will talk more about this in lecture, but the titration curve is, is for your first one, your first, um, acid base reaction is going to look something like this one. It's going to kind of gently increase in pH. So in this region, you don't need to take as many readings. You don't need to take them as frequently. The recommendation is about every milliliter um, stop and keep the data point in the lab quest. You do that by just clicking the keep button in the lower left corner of the screen. Don't hit the stop button until you have completely generated this whole entire S shape. Okay. Um, the stop button means the experiment is over. Keep allows you to make each and every data point. And so in the beginning, you, you only need to collect about every milliliter. Then when you start to see, and you don't know where this point's going to be, it'll be different for each um, setup. But when you see this increase start to occur. In other words, the pH is increasing much faster than it initially does. Then you want to start taking more and more frequent measurements. Okay, so what we're going to do is the very first time you titrate it, you don't even measure the pH curve. You're just going to titrate it like we do in 141. This is called a rough titration. So you don't need to be very picky about getting a pale pink color. Um, but when you when you start to see the pinkish color sticking around longer and longer, slow down, go drop by drop, so you can find the equivalence point. And so that's the point where the pH is changing the most rapidly. So you're looking for the rough titration to give you an idea of where you need to slow down. So let's pretend like I titrate mine and I get a pale pink color around 30 milliliters. Okay, so what that tells me is I can go from like zero milliliters of base to maybe like 27 milliliters or 28 milliliters, I can, I can get pretty close to that equivalence point by taking one mil increments um, for my pH measurement. But once I get pretty close to the equivalence point, one mil would be too big. What you would actually see is essentially the, the curve looks like, like this, I'll, I'll make it a blue line. So if you do it in one mil increments and you get close to the equivalence point, you're still doing one milliliter, what's going to happen is you're not going to get the S shape. That's supposed to be a dot. There we go. You're going to get a line that looks like that. And that's not enough to give us the information we need. So the purpose of slowing down your measurements when you're close to the um, equivalence point is to allow you to get this S shape. Okay, so yeah, so if it was 30 mils for my rough titration, when I measure the pH in the next run, I'm going to do like 0 to 27 or 28 at 1 mil increments. And then when I get to 27 or 28, I'll make it much smaller, like half or even a quarter of a milliliter at a time. And that'll allow you to get a nice S-shaped curve. When you get up to the top of this curve, so you see it starting to flatten out, you can go back to one milliliter increments, but you want to make sure to go long enough in your titration to get a nice flat plateau at the end. Okay, so that's your first two titrations. Your third titration is going to be of a, a diprotic acid. So that means you're going to have two different bumps, um, two different equivalence points. And so don't stop when you get to this first one. It's not going to be as obvious as this. This is theoretical data. It'll be a little bit less obvious like this. But don't stop after that first point. You want to keep going all the way until you get a nice, very flat 
pH at the top. You want to make sure to record um, in your lab notebook at what point the, um, the pink happens. So when you do your graph, you're going to write on here where, where the pink, the end point is what we call that. You're going to write on your graph where that occurs at. But we're going to go way past that in both cases. Um, the, it's going to be like bright fuchsia up here. Okay, so um, that's the titration part of the experiment. Um, you're going to be doing three titrations in total, one rough for your first one. This is also going to be a little bit different because when you measure the pH, you want to make sure the solution is really, really homogenous. So what you're going to do is set up a stir plate, which is a hot plate, but you're not going to use the hot part. And so you'll have a beaker with a magnet in it and your acid and the water and the phenol phthalene. And you'll put that beaker onto the stir plate to mix it while you're doing your titration. Um, and that way, when you measure your pHs, it will be much easier to get a consistent reading. Um, I'll have a setup in the front of each lab when you come in so you can kind of get an, a visualization of what it's going to look like. Um, you kind of have to turn the hot, hot plate like sideways to get it to work out. So I'm going to put that up there so you can see what, what you should be doing for the titration when you measure pH. When you do the rough titration, you don't need to stir. At least, you know, not any more than you, you just swirl the flask by hand. You don't need to use the magnet to stir it is what I mean by that. Okay, so the waste for part one all goes in the sink. That's just acids, bases, which are going to neutralize to form salt and water. So you can throw that in the sink. Part two is normally done as a group. So um, in this case, what we're going to do is you each will have one of the five salts that you need to measure the pH for on your table. Okay, so these are the five salts. You have to make sure you measure all five of these before you leave lab uh, on the day of the experiment. And you also need to measure the pH of distilled water because one of the questions in the lab is how does the pH of the water affect it? We would expect it to be seven if it's pure water, but as per our discussions before in, in lecture, it's really hard to have pure water. So it's probably not exactly seven. It's definitely not exactly seven. <laughs> okay, so anyway, these calculations are part of your pre-lab, so you need to have those answers written in your lab notebook. And um, I'll let you know if you have them correct before lab begins. And then, so each person will be making one of these solutions. Then what you need to do is take your 250 milliliter solution and put it into, um, four clean test tubes so that once you have yours done, I'll distribute the test tubes to the other students so they can measure the pH of your solution. And you will get the other four solutions to measure with your pH meter. Don't be shocked that the pHs aren't identical from one instrument to another. That is normal. Okay, so that's our plan. And as always, if you have questions during lab, please don't hesitate to ask. Oh, regarding part two waste. Um, so what you're going to do is label the container, the volumetric flask you use to make your solution in and leave that on your bench. Um, come to think of it, you also need to label the test tubes that I'm going to distribute for you. Uh, otherwise, four of the five solutions are colorless liquids that look like water, so people won't even know what they're measuring. So be sure you do put a label on there. Um, We'll be sure to include wax pencils. You can write directly on the glass with those, um, or you can put a piece of tape and write on that. Make sure it's legible. People can tell what it says, okay? So, but at the end of the experiment, you're just gonna leave the labeled test tubes and volumetric flask on your bench and we'll dispose of them after you leave.